Second Peter chapter 3 verse 15. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 15. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. Next verse. As also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destructions so brother peter speaks about brother paul here and he gave lent credence to the writings of brother paul that brother paul's writings are such that he has been given an insight a sophia he has been given an insight into the Old Testament scriptures. And then we took time to look at a few scriptures. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 to 5. The sound people check Pastor Giles' microphone and make sure it's working quickly. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 to 5. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you world. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now take down Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 to 28 and Romans chapter 16 verse 25 and 26. I like to read that one. Romans chapter 16 verse 25 and 26. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Next verse. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith made known to all nations for the obedience of faith so we said Paul because of the mastery of his language could use a word in three places in a letter to mean three different things the same word mastery of language one word three places it is used to mean three different things and that's why when reading the letters of brother paul you've got to be very careful because of the mastery of words that brother paul or verbiage that brother paul had now we say there are three things you must always look out for in bible study and they're very crucial number one the context of words the context of words. Now, context becomes effective when you understand the concept. Context becomes effective when you understand the concept inside. Concept is understood by putting the phrases all together. Concept is understood by putting the phrases all together. Where you look at a paragraph, for example, what is the concept of this context? You ask yourself, what is the concept of this context? Then you look at it properly. So in study, you first of all look at the context of the words. Because if you lose the context, you will lose everything he is going to say. Very important. You must pay attention to the context. The Bible is a contextual material. So you must always pay attention to context. I've told you. In Bible study, context is king. Context is king. So Bible study weathers a lot into reading well. And a gnosko, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Jesus keeps asking, have you not read? Brother Paul will write to Timothy, till I come, give attendance to reading. Reading, reading. He asked the eunuch in Acts chapter 8, Understandest thou what thou readest? So in proper Bible study, you cannot escape reading. And that's why I'm writing books and encouraging you, no matter what you do, don't go without the books that I'm writing for you. Make sure you do everything to buy those books and read them. And read them thoroughly. It's so critical and important 
for your equipping and for your education so reading is part of bible study because what you do not read well you cannot understand number two what you do not read well you cannot interpret you must be able to read something well to be able to interpret what the author's intent is in that communication ephesians chapter 3 verse 4 ephesians chapter 3 verse number 4 whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of christ whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge which is to capture the details when you capture the details my knowledge in the mystery of christ you capture the details so you will see the context and context is what was he saying before he got to this point what did he say before what did he say afterwards now concept is what did he say and what is he what is he intending to achieve by putting the phrases together intelligently what is he intending to achieve by putting the phrases together intelligently the last will be the implication of what he said implication can also be seen from interpretation so the act of the context and the concept the act of the context and the concept is what we call exegesis the act of the context and the concept is what can be called exegesis exegesis exe exegesis where you look at it well and then you ask yourself what was he explaining what did he say before what did he say after what was he explaining then you now look at the implication of what he was saying so when you see prophets somewhere don't merge it with somewhere else you may be making an error it's the same way we have used righteousness anyhow you know in the pentecostal setting and the word eternal life and we will look at those concepts eventually in the course of this teaching you know you have to look at things within usage now look at colossians chapter 1 verse 25 colossians chapter 1 verse 25 whereof i am made a minister according to the dispensation of god which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of god wherefore i am made a minister to fulfill the word of god the word minister is the word diakonos diakonos d-i-a-k-o-n-o-s where we have the word deacon diakonos minister Paul calls himself a deacon. <laughs> Take note of that. Paul calls himself a deacon. Diaconus. It's used by Jesus also for himself. In the book of Matthew 20, 28. Read for me Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 and 29. Even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, a diaconos, a deacon, to minister and give his life. That's how he ministered. He ministered by giving his life a ransom for many. It's also used for Jesus in Romans chapter 15 verse 8. Look at the way brother Paul uses the word deacon for Jesus. In Romans 15 verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Jesus was the minister of the circumcision for the aletia of God. For the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So Jesus is the minister of the circumcision. As used by way of allusion in Galatians chapter 2 verse 17. Now so Paul says, I am made a minister. But you notice that this is like Ephesians chapter 3 verse, verse 3 to 5. Which we just read. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5. Put up that Ephesians 3 5. Read for me verse 5. 
which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles, which are prophets by the Spirit. Now look at the word hid. Even the mystery which has been hid, or the word hidden, the word apocrypto, apocrypto, used by Jesus in Luke 10, 21. Luke Chapter 10, Apocrypto, used by Jesus, hidden or hid, in Luke chapter 10, verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. That thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent but has revealed them unto babes. Now this is something that we need to read very well. You know, to hide could be, I don't want you to see it. So it is put in a way that you cannot see it. But this is a metonymy. A metonymy is a figure of speech in literature. That statement is a metonymy. All right, now, a metonymy in language is where four people did something then one person is mentioned as the actor. Four people were involved in an act, and one person is mentioned as the actor. That's the word metonymy. Now, when he says the wisdom and the prudent, he has hid it from them, but revealed them unto babes. Well, don't you think Jesus is talking about an attitude? I mean, just think about it. Don't you think it's the attitude he's talking about? That the wise and prudent will be those who believe they know. So they don't need anything to know. Because they already know. Those who believe they understand. The babes will be those who are innocent enough to want to learn. So let me ask you. God is mentioned. The prudent is mentioned. The wise is mentioned. And the babe is mentioned. See the characters. God the prudent, the wise, and the babes. Four different characters in that verse. Now, why is it hidden? Is it hidden because God doesn't want them to know? Or is it hidden because they are wise? Huh? Because they are wise. So the hiding of the hidden is in the mind of a man. The hiding of the hidden is in the mind of a man. What hides the word of God is the attitude of a man. What hides the word of God is the attitude of a man. That's why I always say that revelation is how you receive. Revelation knowledge is how you receive. Just like 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7, read for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a, in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Why did he call it hidden wisdom? He said, not in the words which man's wisdom speaketh or which man's wisdom teacheth. First Corinthians 2, 13 and 14. Earlier on he said, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are wise. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are wise. So if it is hidden, it is not hidden because God is doing the hide and seek. It is hidden because they are wise. So to say the wisdom of God is hidden from the wise is a figure of speech. God does not hide things in the sense of he puts things in darkness. In him is light. In him is no darkness at all. In him there are no shadows at all. So if there are shadows and darkness... The shadows and darkness will be in a man's mind. If there are shadows and darkness, the shadows and darkness will be in a man's mind that hides the mind of that man away from revelation knowledge. 
or that gives revelation knowledge away from his mind. So when you see those words, it's relative. So when the gospel is preached, the Greeks who are learned calls it foolishness. The Jews who are religious say it's an offense. But to us who are saved, of which we also have Jews and Greeks, is called the power of God. So when you hear it's hidden, it is hidden because of a man's attitude towards the gospel. It is hidden because of a man's attitude towards the gospel. For example, when Jesus mentioned it in Matthew chapter 13 verse 11. Read for me, Matthew chapter 13 verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Why is it not given to them? Give me verse 15 of that same chapter. Verse 15, it now explains why it is not given to them. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. This people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. I didn't close their eyes. I didn't close, they closed their eyes, they closed their heart because their attitude is we don't need it. We already know. So that attitude is what keeps the world from their understanding. It's what blocks them from revelation knowledge. It's not God, it's their attitude towards the word of God. That's the reason why it is a mystery. The mystery is because of the state of their hearts. What will unlock their hearts is faith in Christ. What unlocks their heart to revelation knowledge is faith in Christ. So it's a mystery because of the state of their hearts. The gospel remains a mystery. The word of God remains a mystery because of the state of men's hearts. Please pay attention. This is very important. Of course, you can take down this. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. Read for me Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. Now read for me Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God. See that? But the hiding there... It's not God hiding. It is men whose attitude are contrary to revelation knowledge. So the mystery is in a man's understanding of the gospel. You know, I told you earlier, when Peter said the things are hard to be understood. Again, they are relative. He's not saying they are hard for everybody to understand. They are hard to be understood. And then he said the people that stumble are the unlearned. The unlearned. And you know, uh, Paul speaking says, the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Again, they are relative. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 26. Colossians chapter 1 verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. But now is made manifest to his saints. Next verse. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Which is Christos and Anai. Christos and Anai, the Greek. That is Christ found with you. Christ in you. Christ found with you. Paul seems to use the language of the incarnation here, which is Christ, Christos and Anai. Christ found with you. God with us, which was seen with Mary in the womb. So he says, Christ in you, which is now made manifest. Now that word manifest again is the word phenorosis, to make naked. Christ is made bare. Christ is unveiled. 
Christ is revealed. We can see everything about him. He's made naked. He's made bare. Phenorosis. Once again, don't forget, what is in view here are the Old Testament writings. Every time Jesus taught, every time the apostles taught, they taught from the Old Testament writings, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. That's how systematic Bible teaching happens. And that's exactly how Jesus taught. And that is how the apostles taught. That is apostolic pattern of Bible teaching. And that's the way to arrive at sound doctrine. Hukaino, wholesome, healthy Bible teaching. Alright? So, it's from the Old Testament writings. Paul used or uses Old Testament vocabulary. So, what he does is to intelligently explain the Old Testament in the New Testament using the vocabulary of the day to open up what seemed to be hidden in the Old Testament. So both the mystery, the revelation, the explanation are related to the Old Testament. But the mystery, the revelation, the information are related to the Old Testament. Old Testament books. Not some mysterious knowledge. Not some mysterious knowledge. Honey, you know, I was thinking about this yesterday, just while I was making my notes. How many of you observe very clearly, please listen to this, it's very, very, very fundamental what I'm about to say to you now, if I get back to my teaching. Do you realize that when Jesus rose from the dead, it will have been easier for him to rise from the dead and just share with him what happened from the cross to the throne from his experience. Oh, gentlemen, I died. And when I died, I was separated from God. Three days, three nights, I paid for the sins of the whole world. Now I have risen as a high priest of the church. These were the things I experienced. But Jesus rises from the dead after three days of experiencing death. Three days of being in hell. And then he rose from the dead. He missed the disciples. And he takes Moses' teaching notes. Beginning at Moses. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? Why are you flabbergasted? Why are you bothered? Why are you faithless? Why are you distraught? Why ought not Christ to have suffered these things? And to enter into his glory... No experience. He goes back to the Old Testament Jewish books. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He now tells them what happened from the cross to the throne. Not from experience, but from the Jewish scriptures. Now that's fundamental. That says a billion things to somebody who is seeking to grow in the knowledge of Christ. He says nothing about experience. He goes back to the Jewish books and expounded unto them. He just interpreted Moses to them. He just interpreted and then he said to them, these are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you. Nothing has changed. Even my experience is in accordance with what I spoke. So there's no need to give you experience. Let's go back to the books. Exactly what you see is exactly what happened. Are we teaching here? Now that's fundamental. That's very, very fundamental. Very, very fundamental. Now, mm -mm. so there is no mysterious knowledge passed across in a hotel room somewhere or from the mountain somewhere. The Old Testament, therefore, will be in view in our study. The Old Testament, therefore, will be in view. Let's look at some things just as a purview of our study before we begin the study. We are still trying to begin the study. Do you get what I'm saying? We are still trying. We are still trying to get to where we will begin our study of Paul's 
ministry gifts. Luke 24, 48. Take note of this. Luke chapter 24, verse number 48. And ye are witnesses of these things. Underline the word witnesses. And you are witnesses of these things. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse number 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You shall be witnesses. Again, take note of the word witnesses. Now, the word here is the word matos. M-A-R-T-O-S. Matos used for an experiential witness. Experiential witness. You shall be matos. Experiential witnesses. Or what we call eyewitness. Now where do you think that phrase is from? The phrase you shall be witnesses is from Moses' account. You are witnesses. You shall be witnesses are from Moses' account. You know this is very relative because you will find out that the genesis of creation... Or Genesis is creation. Exodus will be the exit. Alright. Genesis creation. Exodus will be the exit. The Exodus will be the story of deliverance. The story of salvation. The story of redemption. And how it happened. Genesis creation. Or Genesis the story of the new creation. Exodus, the story of the exit. So the Exodus will be the story of deliverance, the story of salvation, the story of redemption, and how it happens. So it becomes a prefiguring of the deliverance in two ways. A prefiguring of the deliverance in two ways. Number one, the deliverance of the believer from spiritual death. The deliverance of the believer from spiritual death. And the eventual deliverance of the believer's body from death. The deliverance of the believer from spiritual death. And the eventual deliverance of the believer's body from death. So Exodus paints that narrative for us. Now in Numbers chapter 13 verse number 2. Read for me Numbers Chapter 13, verse number 2. Please pay attention. Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. Send thou men that they may search the land. Now you will see something in a few minutes. Now, Moses picks men. He had chosen these people earlier. It's from there he will choose whom he will use. Now he said, who will search the land of Canaan? Who will search the land of Canaan? Again, don't forget the Old Testament will be in view in our teaching, even as we lay the foundation for what we're going to be de delving into as we proceed. Numbers chapter 10 verse 33. Numbers chapter 10 verse 33. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. To search out. Take note of that word. To search out a resting place for them. Numbers chapter 13 verse 16. Numbers chapter 13 verse number 16. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. Underline the word spy. He sent them to spy out the land. These are the men that Moses sent to spy out. That word spy is the word tall. T-U-R. Tall. That's the word spy. Then you can also read verse 21 and verse 25 of Numbers 13. Girl, look, read for me verse 25. Numbers 13, 25. 
And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they returned, the spies returned, the tall returned from searching of the land after 40 days. Now let me ask you, what they were to do, was it to affirm what God has said or to be creative? Huh? To affirm. Their job was to be a witness. So the word tall is to witness, to be a evidence, to witness or to be a evidence. Look at verse 32 of Numbers 13. Numbers chapter 13, verse 32. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. The land, they brought an evil report of the land where they went to search. So they brought an evil report and the word there is the word Diba. Diba. D-I-B-B-A-H. Evil report. Evil report. Diba. This word is a slander. Slander. The word Diba is a slander. It's to say what is not true. The word evil report is a slander. To say what is not true, it is to negate another person. To negate another person. It is to refuse to corroborate. To refuse to corroborate evidence. The word is slander. It is to say what is not true. It is to negate another person. To refuse to corroborate evidence. Look at Numbers chapter 14 verse 36. Numbers chapter 14 verse 36. And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land. By bringing up a slander upon the land. Deba. Look, look at verse 37 before we go. Verse 37 of Numbers. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. They died by the plague. So from here we find a witness who simply will affirm God's promises. Oh, I have seen what God promised. This is it. I have seen what God said. This is it. I have tasted of the Lord's goodness. This is it. I have experienced the faithfulness of God. I am the first fruit of those that experienced it. I am affirming that what God said is exactly like that. I am a testimony to the word of God. They were to affirm what God said. So the word matos, M-A-R-T-O-S, witness, and the word tor, are one and the same. Now pay attention to something. It was the same 40 days upon which the 12 became witnesses. They went to search for 40 days and when Jesus was raising witnesses after resurrection, he taught them for 40 days. Which means the other spies were a prefiguring of what these other spies will do. Because everything in the New Testament takes its narrative from the prefiguring of the Old Testament, beginning at Moses. Please pay attention. So when they came back, they were, they, they were what we call today false witnesses. This evil report guys, this slander guys, Diba, they were evil witnesses or false witnesses or what we call today false teachers. False teachers who seek to negate what Christ has done? Who play down redemption? And zero in redemption on man's efforts, on works. These were false teachers and false witnesses. Whereas Caleb and Joshua, so always watch, watch, watch. How many of you realize the spies were 12? But only two affirmed the word of God. Ten refused to affirm the word of God. There are always more false teachers than teachers of God's word. It's not just today. It's been like that from even the prefiguring. Ten came. So it's not always the best to go with the popular. 
You have to find out what God is in. God is never always in the majority. Never always. Ten came back with evil reports, slander. They refused to affirm the word of God and they refused to corroborate God's word. Rather, they affirmed Satan's words against God's word. But Joshua and Caleb brought the gospel. Oh, glory to God. They brought the gospel. They affirmed what God said. They did not bring contrary evidence. But let me ask you. Did Joshua and Caleb see the giants? Did they see the obstacles? But they refused to affirm what the devil is saying. They affirm what God said. They had more confidence in what God said than in whatever the devil says. They had more confidence in the word of God than in the circumstances of life. They had more confidence. They affirm what God said. It's like the devil says you're sick. Now you have the symptoms. You have the pain. And you have the medical evidence. Now you are in a straight between. You're either going to be a Joshua and Caleb. Or you're going to be among the ten spies. You will either negate the word of God by the testimony of your doctor. Or you will stay with God's word against every evidence. Against every pain. And take sides with God. And corroborate God's word and affirm God's word than to slander God's word by agreeing with the doctors. Joshua and Caleb said, No. <laughs> so Jesus, using the Moses' account, don't forget his teaching from Moses. He now said, The same way you will be my witnesses, you will be my tour. Those who with the 40 days of study and personal experience will now go back to the people and say, we have seen the promised land. We have seen the promised land. And this is what we're going to look, look out systematically in this study. So Jesus equally uses the narratives of the law. The law now will refer to Moses' writings. The law will refer to the writings of Moses. Like I said to you, every writer of the Bible wrote from Moses. Every writer of the Bible wrote from Moses. Moses. That's why you will see Moses and the prophets. Every time they spoke about them, Moses was a stand alone. Moses and the prophets. Not Moses and Isaiah. Moses stand alone. All the prophets grouped together. That says something to you. Every time they spoke, it was always Moses as a stand alone. Because Moses is the genesis of writings. Moses is the genesis of writings. So Moses foreseen that the gospel will be witnessed by men. Moses foreseeing that the gospel will be witnessed by men. Look at it again. The physical resurrection of Jesus will not attest to what happened to him in the spirit. What those guys will say about Canaan will attest to the promises of God given by Christ. So they were the same language. They were to go, affirm, and come back. They went, and they came back, and they mixed the message. They went, they came back, and they mixed the message. So when the writer of Hebrews will say in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2, read for me girl. Hebrews chapter 4 verse number 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. It was preached unto them as well as unto us. He was referring to Joshua and Caleb. Those who did not enter in because of unbelief, both unbelief and faith therefore are products of what you hear. Both unbelief and faith are products of of what you hear. So the spies of the new covenant. Will be the 12 apostles. The spies of the new covenant. 
will be the 12 apostles. I'm teaching good this morning, right? Okay. It will be the 12 apostles. To say otherwise is to slander. Let me ask you. Look at me for a minute. I know you're right. Who did they slander? Huh? The spies that came back. Who did they slander? Huh? God. They slandered God. So unbelief is a slander. You are saying God's word is not what it says it is. When you are in unbelief, you are saying that God is not true. So Luke 24. Now pay attention to this. <clears throat> pay attention here. No writer of the epistles ignored Moses. No writer. I'm almost amazed at some of today's emergency preachers. What did I call them? Emergency preachers. They call themselves grace preachers. <laughs> and then they will say, don't listen to Moses. Don't listen to Moses. Discard the Old Testament. We don't need the New Testament. We only need the New, we don't need the Old Testament. We only need the New Testament. Discard, in fact, remove the Old Testament. <laughs> what? So if you remove the Old Testament, who should I listen to? That's why I call them emergency preachers. Grace preachers. <laughs> they come up with these theories. Moses, my servant, is dead. Away with Moses. What? He has been dead a long time. It's not now he died. Don't pay attention to those guys. They are just. They are overnight people. No details. And they won't last also. The way they came overnight. They go overnight. <laughs> Moses therefore will be what you can call. The intellectual foundation of this. Moses will be what we call. The intellectual foundation of the scriptures. What's touching something quickly so you don't interrupt what's going on here? Mm -mm. Moses will be the intellectual foundation of the scriptures and of the prophets. Look at Luke 24, verse 25 to 26. Luke chapter 24, verse 25 to 26. And he said unto them, O fools. Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and all the prophets? He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now pay attention to something. The previous discussion is that the women came to them and told them what they saw. The women after resurrection, they came to them and they told them what they saw. Now look at what these people told those women. Luke chapter 24 verse number 11. Luke chapter 24 verse number 11. Read for me. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Pastor Brace, can you see that? Their words seemed to them. When the woman told them what they saw, the grave is empty, he is no longer there. Their words seemed to these disciples like idle tales. What are you talking about? Get out. What are you talking about? You, you, you went there and he's not there. Don't lie to us. You like Jesus too much. You're just being sentimental. They saw their words as idle tales. Hmm. Now pay attention to, to something else here. They thought it was a fable, a muthos. Look at verse 12 and 13 of the same chapter. 
Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wandering in himself at that which was come to pass. Next verse. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. Next verse. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. Now they began to talk about how all these things had happened. Now you know the background of that journey was a mixed grill, as it were. What happened in Kadesh Barnea was almost playing out. You remember Kadesh Barnea? The spies, the report, and all that. Okay. That the report of the promised land was doubted. So the report of his resurrection also is being doubted. Same thing. Now look at verse 15 to 19 of Luke 24. Verse 15 to 19. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Next verse. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Next verse. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Next verse. And the one of them whose name was Cleopas answering said unto him, Are thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there, there in these days? Next verse. And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet. That's all the disciples knew. This guy was a prophet. Just like Isaiah died and went. Jeremiah died and went. This Jesus said was also in their class. This is what Cleopas, the disciples of Jesus, that's the view they held. That's why they couldn't believe the women who told them the guy has risen. Now, their reasoning was what hid the truth from them. See that? Their reasoning didn't allow them to see beyond the veil. Their reasoning because if you look at Moses' explanation of Canaan, you know that Moses offered Canaan to the people as a prefiguring. What he spoke about was life. Moses spoke life to the children of Israel. Moses spoke to them that they were going to be a kingdom of priests. A priesthood. A kingdom. So it is in their mind that they were too wise. So they did not see the simplicity of what they were saying. That Luke chapter 24, 25, full slow of her to believe all that the prophets, mark the word prophets. You know, I said to you that everyone who speaks about Christ in the Old Testament, they are all prophets. Every Old Testament person that spoke about Christ was a prophet. Some of them were not even named but you will find out when you study that they were prophets. So Luke 24, 26, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He called them brados, slow of heart, because they did not follow through. So here Jesus does what we are about to see in the Pauline letters. He goes to the writings of Moses. Then all the prophets. Don't forget all the prophets of the Old Testament quoted Moses. So it was vital to state Moses in his own class. Remove the first five books of Moses. Then you have a detached book of Revelation. Once you remove the first five books of Moses, your Bible, your Bible, <laughs> your Bible, <laughs> your Bible becomes substanceless. The first five books of Moses. Then there is nothing to refer to anymore. All the narratives, all the figures of speech, in the entire Bible, we are borrowed from Moses. I've told you before, right? Moses laid the building blocks of Bible doctrine. So that's why in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, scattered across, you will see building blocks. Heaven, earth, light, 
darkness. You see all of that. Christ in figures, seed of the woman, serpent on the pole, blood on the doorpost. All those are building blocks. You see temple. You see tabernacle. You see the journey to the promised land. You see the spice. All those are building blocks. Are we teaching here? All those are doctrinal building blocks. So Moses is the father of Bible doctrine. All those are doctrinal building blocks. All the narratives. So he now expounded unto them. Jesus now interpreted the word expounded. The word daimenua in the Greek. Which means to interpret destination. The things concerning himself. Keywords. Daimenua and feri in the Greek. Feri is used when you focus on something. The things concerning. That means the daimenua was focused on himself. The interpretation was focused. He was the focus of all the interpretations of the scriptures. So that means there are things Jesus looked away from. That means there are things Jesus did not consider. That means the only thing Jesus considered, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, were the things concerning himself. Not everything, the things. Which means there was a focus to his Bible interpretation concerning himself. And knowing fully well, there are no chapters in the Old Testament called Christ chapters. What he simply meant was that within the length of time, he went through the scriptures he did a quick study within 40 days for his disciples. A quick study. And they saw a quick interpretation of words. A quick interpretation of phrases of the Old Testament books. Now mark this very, very vital. Ought not Christ, verse 26 of Luke 24, ought not Christ to have suffered these things from the Old Testament writings? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things from the Old Testament writings and to enter into his glory? Esekomai tos doxa. That's the Greek word. Esekomai. That is something that is yet to happen. To enter into Esekomai. He has never been there before. This is the first time he will enter into this glory. He's never been there before. To enter into his glory, he was not returning to the glory. He was entering into that glory for the first time. This is glory he has never been into before. <laughs> you know what, what some people teach is that Jesus was once upon a time in the glory. Then he left the glory and came down. Then he went back and entered the glory. No. The glory of his resurrection, he has never entered it before. Because he has never risen from the dead before. That's why he used the word to enter. Not to re-enter. To enter. A first time entrance. To enter into his glory. He did not return. His enter. He didn't return to his glory. He entered. You can't use glory or glorified for what was restored. You can't use the word glory or glorified from the history of the usage of the word, from the etymology of words. You can't use the word glory for what you have experienced before. The word glory or glorified is used for exaltation or conferring of honor. So he walks the events of his resurrection from the Old Testament writings. Am I teaching good? If you're here, can I have a powerful amen? amen? Good, 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 good. We're moving, we're moving. So whatever is not seen in the Old Testament could not have been taught by Christ. Anything not seen in the Old Testament couldn't have been taught by Christ. And Christ didn't teach anything that was not in the Old Testament. Everything he taught was from the Old Testament. He didn't teach about his experiences. He didn't come with a new book from heaven. No, he taught from the Old Testament writings. How many of you observe Jesus never quoted himself? He never quoted himself. He only explained the Old Testament. And all his quotes were not self-generated. 
all the quotations of Jesus were not self-generated. You can find every of his sermons in the Old Testament books. In fact, you will find the adjectives many times. You will find the figures of speech many times from the Old Testament. So in this glory, which is the resurrection, we see that his explanation of the resurrection is from the Old Testament. Luke 24, 44. Luke chapter 24, verse number 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Do you know that all of the writers of the Old Testament, only Moses quoted nobody? Of all the writers of the Old Testament, only Moses quoted nobody, but everybody quoted him, including Jesus. Only, that's why he says stand alone. He's a father now. Look at how God prepared him. Look at what it took God. And the other day, uh, PJ, Jaya was sharing with me and said to me, Daddy, so Moses is the story of Jesus. Me, I never even, I've never even looked at that before. The only one I've looked at before is Joseph. Joseph is the story of Jesus. And she called my attention that Moses is the story of Jesus. And I said, yeah. I've never looked at it. Look at how he was born. Thrown in the, in the, in the river. Jesus in the manger. Rejected by his family for fear. He came unto his own. His own received him not. You follow that? You follow that? Grew up where? Where did Moses grow up? In the palace where? Eh? Where was Jesus taken to as a baby? So Moses is a prefiguring of Christ. Who brought Israel out of Egypt? Eh? Who brought us out of sin? It's a prefiguring. Those characters. But you have to pay attention to come up with all of these. That's what's called revelation knowledge. Are we teaching here? I owe you a small offering after service. <laughs> Good teaching, sister. The priest of the most high. <laughs> glory to God. I say glory to God. Everybody quoted Moses. So Jesus said, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. What has he done now? Two things. Number one, he has helped you think what he taught in the four gospels before he's dead. As the same as what should be taught afterwards. What he has done are two things. Number one, he has taught you to see that what he taught in the four gospels before his death is the same thing that will be taught after his death. These are the words I speak. Meaning what I'm teaching you now, even though I've risen from the dead, is the same that I taught you before I died. Are you following now? Which I said to you while I was yet, the audience of Christ dictated as it were how he used his words. The audience determined his mode of communication. But the message of Christ in the four gospels did not change upon his resurrection. It's the same message before and after. Consistency. Now watch this. The tense is changed. The tense is changed. The audience changed. But the kerugma, the content of the message is the same. Before he died, I will die. After he died, I have died. Before he died, a different audience who didn't understand, when he rose, a different audience of the same people who understood, but the content of the message was death, burial, resurrection, and the glory that followed. So the tenses changed, the audience changed, but the kerugma, you remember kerugma? The kerugma, the message did not change. In fact, in John 14, 26, John chapter 14, verse 26, read for me, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Spirit of Truth, 
the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, upon the resurrection. Let me explain it well. Please give me your attention. When Jesus was saying the Spirit will guide you into all of the truth. When did that happen? He said, when he is come, he will guide you into all of the truth before he died. When he rose from the dead, he taught them for 40 days. That was the spirit guiding them into all of the truth. The 40 days of teaching was the spirit guiding them into all of the truth. The 40 days of teaching was the Numa Aletia. It was the spirit guiding them into all of the truth. What he said in John 14, 26. And what he said in John 16, 12. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. He shall not speak of himself. What he shall hear, shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. John 16, I mean John 12 and John 14. Now those words happened in the 40 days of Bible study. So that was the spirit of truth and that was the spirit of that reality. Because in the Allos Paracletos is the father in the son and the son in the father and the father and the son in the believer. The Allos Paracletos is the father in the son, the son in the father, the father and the son in the believer. The Allos Paracletos. The Allos Paracletos. So in John 14, 26, he says it as though he is talking about a different person entirely. Give me John 14, 26. Read for me. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said to you. But question, but did Jesus do that in the 40 days? Huh? Did he teach them all things? Did he bring all things to their remembrance? The word to your remembrance is the word hupomimnesco. Hupo mimnesco remembrance. Mimnesco means to call your attention. It's not memory loss. It's not emphasis remembrance day. It is to call something to your attention. That means there were many things Jesus said, but because of the hardness of their heart, the state of their heart, they didn't see it well. How many of you know those disciples had a hardness of heart? How many of you know that? Uh, give me Mark 16, 14. So that I give you a scripture for that. Mark chapter 16 verse. So don't think because they were disciples of Jesus, they were correct guys. Just like you think everybody that is in power city is a correct guy. It's a liar. Yo. There are some of you looking at me like this. Your, your heart is still stone. Stone. Not that you are not born again. No. Stone when it comes to learning and understanding scriptures. That's why some teachers are just looking at me like this. Like a supervisor general. Even if your brain is electric, you cannot understand. You cannot understand 10% of what I have taught just by looking. Even if your brain is electric. So as you are looking at me like that, no pen, no book in your hand, I know that you are one of those with hardness of heart. I know you are one of them. And my prayer is that God will soften your heart. That's my prayer for you. Give me that Mark 16, 40. I didn't say you should look at anybody. Just be looking at me because if you look too much, the way the, the heart of that person, he can clear your face. So. <laughs> you know, I will beat him. We will not leave this church. We will make peace and stay here. Okay. <laughs> Read for me, girl. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. And hardness of heart. Now, why did he say they had a hard heart? Hard heart. Read for me, girl. Hardness of heart. Why? 
Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So they were disciples. He has been teaching them. They have learned the scriptures together with Jesus. And yet they didn't believe when they say he has risen. That's what Jesus calls hardness of heart. Why were they hardened? Because they were not paying attention. So because they were not paying attention, they couldn't comprehend what he was teaching. You say you guys have you have a hard heart. They were hardened. Their heart didn't open up to the truths of the scripture. The state of their heart, no matter what he said, they couldn't see. The teaching is becoming so long. Papa should just be bringing it in peace, peace meal. <laughs> You try. You try. We have a lot to cover. We are just warming up. For your info. Touch your neighbor, say neighbor. Walk day. We just they bring them. Fasting your seat belt. Glory to God. Are you excited? I said, are you excited? Even if you're not excited, that's your business. <laughs> I will teach you this word. And you will catch it. Tell your neighbor, you will catch it. It will enter. We are praying. You are sitting down. You are listening. It will enter. It will enter. Glory to God. I say, glory to God. So when he stood in the temple and said, destroy this temple, after three days, I will raise it up. John 2, 19. After, look, look, look at it. John chapter 2, verse 19. Read for me, PJ. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. In three days, I will raise it up. Now, after Jesus rose from the dead, give me verse 20 now, 20. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Next verse. But he spake of the temple of his body. Next verse. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now after he rose from the dead, they remembered the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, for he spake about his body. Question, how did they remember? It's not like they say, ah, no. He was the one that taught them. When he rose from the dead, he now taught them. Now, while he was teaching them now with an open heart, they now remembered or they now understood that this is what he said unto them. He was the one that thought them. So the remembrance, he will bring all things to your remembrance, is Jesus' teaching ministry. He will bring all things to your remembrance, is Jesus' teaching ministry. That's why when he rose from the dead, he brought to their remembrance everything for 40 days. And when he said destroy this temple, it was when he rose from the dead after explaining to them that they now remembered. Give me that verse 22 of John 2. John 2, 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had they said. They now believed the scripture which was teaching them and what Jesus had said. So, a beautiful and intelligent student of the scripture must not segregate books of the Bible. An intelligent student of the Bible must not segregate books of the Bible. He must read them as one. The whole book, 66 books, you must read them as one. The latitude we have today is that we have the Pauline letters. They didn't have the Pauline letters. Those disciples didn't have the Pauline letters. All they had were the Jewish letters. Genesis to, to Malachi. You know in Paul's day what he called Mysterion. And what he called the Apocalypse. 
what is teaching of the Old Testament. So look at me. In Paul's day, Mosterion was Genesis to Malachi. Apocalypse was what he taught from the Genesis to Malachi account. You see that? The Apocalypse. What he taught. What Paul himself thought. If you came to the service in Ephesus, if you're a member of Paul's church and you came to the service in Ephesus, you have to come with the scroll. If your father, your grandfather was a high priest, you will have access to the scroll. So you will carry the big scroll to church and then you will open and open to wherever Paul is teaching between Genesis and Malachi. So the scroll must have been a big book, very big scroll. And of course, there's what they call the codex. The codex, the scroll and the codex. The scrolls are the ones they roll or the codex which was more modern than the scroll back then in Ephesus. So you come with the scroll in your, you know, like I said, if your grandfather was a high priest. So if you had come to Paul's church, what you will carry will be the scroll to service. What you'll be reading in Paul's service will be Moses. When Paul will say something, you will go and open to where Moses said it. Then Paul will now explain it from the scroll. He will explain it in the verbiage of revelation knowledge. So they didn't have New Testament. All they had was the Old Testament Jewish books. The scrolls. So you can imagine how tedious it was to study under that testament. Under that dispensation. You can imagine going to church. And you know that's why Paul will spend morning till evening evening till midnight midnight till morning in one bible study because they are busy going to the jewish scrolls and looking for where he is teaching then when they have found it he will explain then he will say another one they will now read chapter one chapter two chapter three chapter four and be looking for what paul is talking about when they find they will now zero in there he will explain. He will make another reference. And you know, there were no chapters. There were no verses. So, everything has to be read to arrive at what Paul was teaching. It was tedious Bible study. Today, we have the latitude of they have broken it down for us in books and chapters and verses with punctuations that sometimes we have to shift here and shift there to get the full meaning and import of the context. Bible study at any time. It's not a tea party. And even now, it's not a tea party. But it was worse at that time. So that means, if you are in Christ's audience, if you are in the audience of Christ, what will be your material? Huh? Moses. If you are in Christ's audience, Moses will be your material. So we are only blessed for all the epistles you had. Imagine how long they had to read that's why Paul will say, whereby when you read, because it's a culture for Bible students. Every Bible student is a reader. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul's letters answered Paul's prayers. Did I tell you that a few days ago? Huh? Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. After praying that prayer in chapter 1, he comes to chapter 3 and he gives you the answer, whereby when you read, you may understand. So the eyes of your understanding will only be enlightened when you read. So my prayer for you in chapter 1 will be answered, not automatically, it will be answered when you accept responsibility to read. It is in reading you will come at that understanding. The understanding is not automatic. It will come by teaching. It will come by reading. Are we teaching here? So when you pray the Pauline prayers, make sure you read the Pauline books. Don't pray the Pauline prayers and go and read a book on dangerous prayers. <laughs> Don't pray the Pauline prayers and go and read books on 40 keys to the millionaire's mind. When you pray the Pauline prayers, you read the Pauline books. 
Don't pray for your disciples whom you are raising the Pauline prayers and give them one book from somewhere. No, when you pray Pauline prayers, the Pauline prayers are answered in the Pauline theology. His prayers are answered in his teachings. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the Old Testament teachings of Christ. In the Genesis to Malachi teachings, you will understand my knowledge in the Genesis to Malachi teachings of Christ. So if you are in Jesus' audience, your soul material will be the Old Testament books. In Luke 24, 44, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. That means that the words of Jesus in the four Gospels, he made many promissory notes. All his words, many of his words in the four Gospels were promissory notes. Eternal life was a promise. The bread was a promise. The wine was a promise. Healed was a promise. Life was a promise. Your heavenly father was a promise. These are the things that must be fulfilled. The pleurophenia, the pleurophenia, they must be fulfilled. So in the four gospels, most of his teachings were like a campaign. Jesus was campaigning. Not the political campaign of your time oh, where politicians go and make promises that till they die they can never fulfill. That's not what I'm talking about. The campaign here is Jesus' campaign of what he will fulfill upon his resurrection. He will tell them something like, when you pray say our father which that's a campaign because at that time he was not their father. Fatherhood will be a post-resurrection reality. Pray our father. That's a campaign. When he says, come unto me, all ye that are thirsty, come and drink. There was nothing to drink at that time. It was a post-resurrection promise. It was a campaign. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. You have life. There was no flesh to eat. It was post-resurrection. I give you eternal life and you shall never perish. It was a campaign statement. He that believeth in me shall not come into condemnation but has passed from death to life. John 5 24. It's part of his campaign promises. There were those things that must be fulfilled upon his resurrection. So just like Moses, Jesus' miracles many times we are deliberate all the miracles, most of Jesus' miracles, we are deliberate to point your attention to the message. They were deliberate to point your attention to the message. His healing ministry was to show his redemptive sacrifice. He healed to show that he will heal our spiritual condition. His miracles of supply, where he had, where he had in John chapter 6, to show eternal life. He supplied them bread. That's why the next time they came for more supply, he told them, eat my flesh. Because the reason I did the other one was to show you that I will be, I will be the bread of life. They were linked with his eternal work on the cross and afterwards. All these things must be fulfilled. Destroy this temple was a campaign promise. My kingdom is not of this world was a campaign promise. Every time Jesus said, my kingdom, my kingdom, it was his resurrection he was talking about. My kingdom, my kingdom, the kingdom will be in his resurrection. So all of these were campaigns, promissory notes, things that were yet to happen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness was a campaign promise. It's not a scripture for prosperity. Seek ye first the kingdom and all these other things. Which other things? Righteousness, justification. All will be added when you have him. Not all these other things, cars and houses and money. No, no. You, you are reading the Bible with binoculars that are from somewhere. All these other things will come with the kingdom. With my death 
burial and resurrection, which is the kingdom, will come righteousness, justification, holiness, acceptance, all this. This is what Paul taught as blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places according as he has chosen us in him. That chosen in him is part of the things that are added along with his kingdom. Am I teaching here? All those were campaign promises. So it therefore shows that the fulfillment will be upon his resurrection. That's why I say, these are the words which I spoke unto you. What, that all these things, these campaign promises, these campaign promises will be fulfilled. Which were written in the law of Moses. Honey, you know in the law of Moses there is bread. There is wine. In the law of Moses there is temple. Which Jesus repeated. Because Jesus was echoing Moses in the making of his campaign promises. Which was now fulfilled upon his resurrection. Consistency of theology. Are we teaching here? Are we teaching here? Yeah. So Jesus taught. He taught these things. So the way Moses uttered those things as a prefiguring, as a promise. Jesus taught the same in the four gospels. That's why he told them, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Me and Moses, we are saying the same things. Look at John chapter 5 as I wrap up this service and I will continue in the next service. These are not teachings you want to stay out of any session. These are not teachings you want to stay out of any session because it's a progressive building. You miss that, you miss that, then you come for this, you have set up yourself for a conf confusion. You've got to follow through. You've got to follow. Students of the word follow through. They follow through because you know that these are your equipping moments to shake your world with the gospel of Christ. Say, I hear you. Say with me, I do the work of ministry. Effectively, I serve Jesus in the gospel of his death, burial, and resurrection. Are you blessed this morning? John 5, 45, as I wrap, wrap this service. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father there is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. Next verse. Next verse. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Next verse. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? It means Moses is the one that accuses you. The word kataguru. Why does Moses accuse them? Matthew 19. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you, suffered, suffered you to put away your wives because of unbelief. So Moses presented life and faith. And when they were stiff necked, he now accused them. So the gospel for us will be to look at the things concerning Christ. The gospel to us will be to look at the things concerning Christ. The gospel is Christ and him crucified. The gospel is centered on the person of Christ. His redemptive work and his redemptive sacrifice. The gospel is the message of the Christ. So we say the Bible is a Christocentric material that carries with it a Christocentric message. All through the book. Is the message of one person, Christ, his redemptive sacrifice, and the believer in him. The believer in him. Don't forget, we're still looking at Paul's ministry gifts. We're laying a framework on which we will build the ministry gifts upon. Which, if you miss this framework, you won't understand anything about the ministry gifts. Because those ministry gifts will set you properly to serve God's purpose in your generation. What we're actually looking at in this study is the plan of God for you, the purpose of God for you, from the beginning of time. What the whole plan is and how you fit into that plan, fulfilling God's mandate upon your life. You will never, be, you will never fail. That you will know you'll be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey neighbor, I pray for you today. You'll be filled with the knowledge 
of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. If your neighbor is not praying for you, you are free to change your neighbor. I pray for you right now that you'll be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Stand on your feet. Let's pray that prayer together for each other that you'll be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, that you become fruitful unto every good work. Zikola Tabaraka. I'd like you to hold your neighbor quickly. Let's pray together for another 60 seconds that your neighbor be filled with the knowledge of his will. The knowledge of God's will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Bira na ganga legoroto sokele ne mama legado jigele ne mo satate agalo bareke teninga le baroko tu jakande galu laboro koto sekila na mane agalano goroto sakale ne maraka toteta agalado jekele ne mo sota tatale ne boya be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding the eyes of your understanding being flooded with light lego sandele bo sakaya legoroto sikele ne Bobo Shakela Nama, La Grota, Sekeleda, Agara Degeliga Lanamo, Sekele de Mosatata, Angeleta, 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 be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You are fruitful unto every good work, strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. You are filled with all the fullness of God, the maximum load of God. Anga Shuta Lanama, Le Garata Sekele. You walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Leko sunda la nama shakata. Agereke de sokolo de bo sakeana. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for your neighbor. This year, you will do ministry. This year, you will serve God's purpose. This year, you will walk in the plan of God. This year, you will walk in the will of God. This year, you will walk in the purpose of God. No distraction. Your eyes are focused. Your eye is single. Your body is full of light. Your eye is single. Your body is full of light. Your eye is single. Your body is full of light. You will walk and not be weary. You will run and not faint. You are strengthened with might. You are refreshed by the will of God. Your eyes are focused. Your heart is focused. Your passionate. You are dedicated. You are devoted to the purpose of God. Through you, the gospel prospers. Through you, the gospel thrives. By you, the word of his grace fills the earth. Kalarabaya Tatela Tatela Thank you Lord Jesus